Well, look, a lot of people in Coventry and Birmingham, uh, myself and, and my party comrades, uh, campaigned quite vigorously against an elected mayor. We think that it's uh, a diminution of democracy. And in a uh, referendum in both those cities, overwhelming majorities against it were recorded. So when uh, the government and local politicians did a sort of deal, a stitch-up between themselves, we were really, well, to be honest, incensed at what seems to be an extra layer of government that's quite unnecessary, really, without democracy. If we're having an extra layer that's got a proper form of democracy, that's another question, but this isn't like that at all. Well, unambiguously, we are against what's called the neoliberal consensus of the past 30, 40 years. That's to say, the capitalistic uh, international policy originating from Washington that says that we need light governments and low taxes and that uh, the poor should work harder to make life better for themselves, that it's not the government's job to fill the gaps. We disagree with that fundamentally and absolutely. We're in favour of socialism. A communist is simply a socialist who means what he says and does what he means. And we would like to try to be involved in the debate that uh, challenges the notion that there's not enough money. There's plenty of money. The problem is who's got it and where it's located, mostly in the Cayman Islands, it seems. So it's to inject a debate about those kinds of issues in the context of this undemocratic election that we decided to stand. Well, it is uh, a waste of time and money in the way that it's been created because what's happened is that the leaders of councils who are carrying out cuts and austerity for the government, the government's taking more and more money away from them and yet not uh, seeking to try to shore up the uh, awful uh, social consequences of those cuts by finding money from the people who can afford to pay it, the rich, of course, and businesses. And uh, local authority leaders, mostly Labour, are actually just collaborating with this. And what they've done is they've done a deal. Well, we'll do that for you if we have a full guy called Mayor who will carry the can for carrying it all out. And you'll give us a little bit extra for doing this. So they think they've done a great deal, a wheeze really. But it's a deal that doesn't involve the people. The people don't have a chance to scrutinise. And what we really need are people's assemblies in every borough. We need to open up the democracy um, of uh, the West Midlands as it currently stands. I think it is. I think it is actually a huge problem. I would uh, very much welcome uh, the intervention uh, of candidates from more diverse ethnicities. But to be honest, it's really, I think, more for me an issue of class. The vast majority of people um, of Asian and black extraction in Birmingham are working class. And as we can see in America, we've got a political elite that's manipulated the system. Uh, so that, you know, you better watch out if you're a person of colour and you're also working class. I mean, I'm working class, I'm from a working class background, I've spent a lifetime working for working people. I used to be a factory worker uh, in a trade union, I was a trade union representative, an international level, uh, dealing with the European Union. So I want to put something back and what I want to do is I'd like to create the position where we have many more uh, working class people involved in civil society organisations in communities what we shouldn't be doing is, you know, 7,000 people in a ward elect one or two people to go and sit in a meetings for them and they get paid for it. What we should be doing is having a democratic system where streets and groups of streets have residents who collect together and input their ideas into democratic assemblies. I'd like to see a completely different kind of democracy. You know, generation rent, they call young people now. You know, anybody under 40 has got no chance of uh, getting a mortgage. You're expected to pay 40% of your salary to try to in engage in what seems to be a bit of your own capitalism. Whereas people really just want somewhere to live. 
living somewhere and working. These are rights, these are human rights in my opinion. So I think there needs to be a massive change to the way that this whole thing is viewed. One of the really worrying things about the mayoralty is that the way Birmingham has swapped its factories for glitzy palaces in the town centre so that people can come from elsewhere and they're no longer like, oh, Birmingham's a bit of a crap place, isn't it? You know, it looks a bit raw. Now they say, how wonderful it looks. But we haven't got any jobs and we don't have in uh, the suburban areas and in the inner city areas, we don't have the development for ordinary people. Big shops are a thing of the past, big shopping centres and a thing of the past. What we need are communities, live communities, that help people do things together and help small and medium enterprise, enterprises, small businesses, um, develop much better than they currently do instead of having to compete so hard against the big shops. And if you're doing that, there's only one way really to solve the housing crisis. What the combined authority has already done is they've uh, set up a commission, a land commission, composed of estate agents, financiers and developers, the people who want to develop these glitzy palaces, who want to have posh student flats for foreign overseas, um, well-to-do people to come to the University of Britain so they can say they've been to university in Britain. Well, what I want to see are developments for ordinary people in communities. So, hence the discussion, uh, the idea of uh, a new kind of democracy, a people's democracy, where we're engaging with people about what they want. But also, uh, councils have got to deliver massive expansion of uh, council houses, of houses provided um, on a social basis for need. Anybody who needs a house or a home, a flat or whatever it is, should be able to get it as a right. It shouldn't be subject to the market. And so, at best, I think some of the other candidates have talked about a doubling or tripling of the house building programme. But that's on the basis of finding nice plots of land that they'll give to developers, mostly eating away at the green belt between Birmingham and Sully Hill and, uh, uh, and uh, Coventry. Um, giving them that uh, advantage to make money on land which lies fallow, some of it since, you know, since I worked in, the fa factory I worked in, in the 1970s is still standing, but it's falling to bits because nobody's developed it. That's ridiculous. We should have people's homes there. So it's not a question of is there enough money to do it, it's a question of who's got the money. If developers want to make money, then they should be working with the people's government to ensure that we all benefit. There is a way of making sure that everybody gets something out of it, but the problem is that the current system means that ordinary people just sit in the queue. 40,000 young children in Birmingham relying on handouts at food stores. That's not right. That ain't right. And so we actually need something like 15 times the amount of house building to take place today than it is currently in the position. So it needs a bit of a revolution to set things moving. It's a huge problem. Uh, and it's the, I think it's come to many people's attention because the problem really of air quality, I mean air quality in some of our streets and our main roads, is so bad that if there's a school nearby, um, the level of pollution that seeps into the classrooms is such that were it a factory or a block of offices, it would be closed down for health and safety reasons. Yeah, it carries on. This is just outrageous. What we need to do is to control the use of the car. That doesn't mean to punish people, but that means really, I would argue for a very big carrot first before we start looking at tiny sticks. We need to massively improve uh, the provision of public transport in the West Midlands. It used to be good. The tourists came along 30 years ago, deregulated and privatised them. Now what we've seen is fares rise astronomically and usage drop enormously. It needs to be seen not as a business but as a service, a key service, to ensure that the whole of our conurbations are really working and are really joined up. I'd like to see massively low fares 
I'd like to see new vehicles, environmentally friendly vehicles. That's actually an opportunity for us to engage in economic regeneration. We could uh, work with businesses, big companies, who, like for instance uh, LTI, who produce uh, the electric taxi in Coventry. I've negotiated uh, internationally with big conglomerates like this. I know what they want to know how uh, they work. They shouldn't be in politics, they shouldn't be influencing politics. But there's nothing wrong with politics doing business with business. And we could say to them, you produce our electric buses, you produce our electric trams. It's ridiculous. We have to buy a tram in Italy, in South Southern Italy, put it on a low loader and move it across Europe a lot in, with traffic being crawling at three miles an hour until it gets three days later into Birmingham before we can put the tram on the lines. But if we had one in Coventry making uh, our own trams, that would massively stimulate jobs. And I've also argued that we could use that spin-off to develop uh, massive training facilities as well, which I would locate in the Black Country, because anybody's ever been to West Bromwich or to Warsaw lately and seen the level of poverty and um, low development there, we really need something uh, shaking up in the black country. So everywhere, all parts of the Midlands need to benefit from this massive change, but it can only benefit if we change the politics, the dynamics, the economics as well. <laughs> well, imagine uh, a society where um, you get a bus when you just walk out the door, that it's coming within minutes, where you hardly have to bother with payment. Imagine a society where if you're a 16-year-old, unhappy at home, you can go to somebody and say, I need some kind of accommodation, and you're given it. Imagine a society where um, young people, not in employment or in education or in training, can get one of those things, where young people can um, look at the possibility, perhaps, of developing their own uh, small business. I've talked here about giant transnational corporations, which I'm very familiar with, but in some of our communities, the spin-off from uh, bus engineering uh, um, apprenticeship uh, colleges could be the development, because I think we're going to have to address the quality of cars on the road, we could address the possibility of providing uh, business opportunities for people to set up their own car workshops. I don't want to see any car on the road belching fumes, I don't want to see diesel cars on the road, and I don't want to see old bangers that people are keeping because they've got to get to work or they've got to get to town, they've got to get to the shopping because the bus is such a crap thing. So it is possible, I think, if we view this holistically, there's just one flaw in this. Is it a flaw? It's that this is called socialism. And so I'm asking people to think about casting their first preference vote for me uh, for socialism, currently predicted to get over 5% of the vote. That's quite astonishing, actually, from a standing still start. Um, the debates and the air time that I've had in the last few days is showing a massive surge of interest and support. It is possible for me uh, to get even more of that if we get a good, solid vote for socialism, we're chasing the other candidates. I'll tell you this, on the debates, I was the first person to say, I support municipal ownership, council run ownership, ownership by the people, the bus companies, which the Tories would ban. They currently have called a general election, and it's possible that the bill that would have uh, banned councils from owning bus companies will now fail. And then suddenly I start to hear other candidates say they don't necessarily disagree with that. And I, I welcome that because they're good ideas. And so a big vote for a communist candidate is going to push other uh, possibilities further to the left, further to the people's need. And you can use your second preference. I've come across people who say, oh, second preference means, well, I like him better than you, but I like you and about all the others, so I'll put you as number two. That's pointless. That's not going to help. Second preference is when all the smaller parties have been elbowed out and it looks like Greens, Lib Dems and UK 
will be able to happen. And in the final analysis, currently running neck and neck, Labour and Tory will be chosen. Now I understand that polls are suggesting that 85% of people who would vote for me would vote for the Labour candidate. Uh, others are voting Green. That's for them to decide what they would uh, vote for. I would like to see a Labour government, but here what I want to see is a responsive mayor, and I think that's the key. In respect to the party label, a mayor that's responsive to left-wing politics, politics that ordinary people can relate to, and a really thumping vote for a communist candidate out of nowhere would actually be quite a poke in the eye of the establishment. So I would go at it. Well, um, I think I was the only candidate to uh, speak at the United Against Fascism rally in the centre of town of Birmingham uh, when uh, the Nazi and fascist English Defence League turned out. There's now a famous photograph trawling the social media of a young woman uh, facing down fascist thug. I was actually there when that happened. She was simply defending another young woman uh, who was wearing a mark of a uh, celebration of a culture, a scarf. What's so wrong with that? That's disgraceful. In my mind, those kinds of hate acts, and in the terms of the Equality Act 210, are actually more serious uh, if they have a racialist dimension than if they don't. And I think they need to be really confronted. And I have to say, I think that a lot of the mainstream parties and UKIP in particular is not a mainstream party but one obsessed with these issues, uh, pander to racism when they fail to attack it clearly and straightforwardly. Nobody can ever say that communists have ever been shy of fighting fascism and racism. Why, you know, there's that famous phrase, isn't there, from uh, the pastor in Germany, first they came for the communists and they didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist, then a trade unionist, then a socialist, then you know, the Jews, and then it was, it was just me, and then there was nobody left because there was only me and they came for me. Well, communists have fought against fascism consistently. And I know that sometimes we've had a bad press, but our party, our British party, is based on the history of fighting fascism, our greatest heroes in the past of the 500 communists who died when they went to Spain fighting fascism in the 1930s in what many see as the first steps of the Second World War. So for us it's a complete no-no, totally opposed to it. I, I understand this argument that um, the responsive approach in many parts of the world to the uncomfortable domination of it by imperialist powers, principally America and Britain, with America having by far the vast bulk of the world's armaments and producing them. It's almost as if their economy is geared to go into war because if they don't, then they can't buy new armaments. And the government can't keep the companies that produce these going. But they are responses that aren't always positive. The best responses are ones which create unity and which enable people to engage in normal political processes. I don't think that you can define nasty acts as fascism or Nazism. Fascism is a particular kind of expression of capitalist ideology which basically says, when working people get so uppity we can't control them anymore, and we might actually lose control, as they did in Chile in the early 1970s, when a fascist counter-coup took place to prevent a left socialist government from working for the interests of the people. Or as um, the CIA did in 1966, when it helped the fascist leaders of Indonesia murder one million, that's not a mistake, one million Chinese um, ethnicity communists because they were Chinese and not Indonesian and they were easy to find. They just murdered them. You know, so um, the world is full of terrible things that have happened and my enemy's enemy isn't my enemy. It's the only way to fight evil is to develop the broadest possible unity 
of progressive minded people and around ideas like socialism uh, that uh, are based on uh, relations which are positive, welcoming and encouraging. Uh, you know, clandestine activity, underground activity, even, you know, armed actions where they're not necessary. Of course, if you've got repression in somewhere like Second World War France, of course, uh, French men and women resorted to arms to resist the occupation of their country and they were right to do so. But in the modern world, I can't think of any current area of the world where, where life wouldn't be made better by peace talks, where uh, political progress wouldn't be aided by ensuring that people are talking to each other instead of shooting each other. Okay. And the, the part of that question was, is therefore Islamophobia on the rise? Yes, uh, um, Islamophobia is in some ways a terrible expression because you know, it doesn't really convey what's going on here. I mean, my understanding of uh, Islam, I'm an atheist, but, you know, I wouldn't say I'm an atheist of a Christian tradition because that would really be true. But um, in my youth, uh, I had lots and lots of friends who were Hindu, Sikhs, Muslims, and we engaged in lots of interesting talks. And I now have many names similar, um, a wide range of cultures. And the, the, the key thing seems to me always that it's not the religion, it's the culture that seems to be the dominant thing. And we should all celebrate our culture. I come from a culture of working class conventions uh, who worked in large factories and you know, going back to my great great granddad were people who represented ordinary working people. We've always done that. That's my culture and I celebrate that. And I celebrate the cultures of others. My understanding of, of Islam is that it has many expressions and that its culture, its poetry, its art is rich and varied and important. So uh, assigning a, a label which doesn't really help us understand things isn't good. But um, people invent terrible names for people they don't like, don't they? And there's plenty of that been about. Uh, and I think it is uh, the fact that people from a Muslim background have been targeted simply for that, because it's easy to target them. At the time of the Twin Towers bombings, you know, we had in America people with turbans being attacked. Well, they're not. No, they're not from the Islamic tradition. But because they seemed different, people thought that there was somehow that was a way of identifying the enemy. So it's wrong. Um, what happens is that people of power and wealth and influence identify enemies. They target them. They demonise them. That's disgraceful. I'm not uh, entirely comfortable with. Initiative. Um, I think it's very clear as, a, as an amateur historian, I've written widely on the way in which our um, security forces during the 20th century um, penetrated trade unions and left wing political parties on a false basis to undermine them. And I think it was a way of creating an edge, a political power edge for the Conservatives and for the British state. And I think to some extent there's an over-exaggeration of the difficulties and the threats uh, associated with tensions from uh, the Middle East in particular, uh, but Central Asia to some extent, over-spilling them, affecting our society. I think it's over-exaggerated. Um, and to some extent when, when you can't be tolerant of, of alternatives and possibilities, you almost force people into alternatives and possibilities. Uh, I have no personal experience or fear that any of this is really justified. It seems to be focusing on naming individuals in particular sets of circumstances. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that religious extremism is on the rise. In fact, on the contrary, I find second and third generation um, uh, descendants of migrants from the Indian subcontinent are increasing in much more like bromis and the, the culture and cuisine even 
of Birmingham has changed enormously and you can hardly, you know, I have um, children that are now 30 or thereabouts and all their friends are people from uh, countries uh, in the Indian subcontinent and they don't see them as uh, in any way separate or different from themselves and vice versa. So I'm not convinced that that's so. I think rather like the rest of the British population, there is a rise of secularism. I think that's true that the vast majority of people uh, from um, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh and Buddhist cultures are, are seeking a, a peaceful and cooperative West Midlands in which we can work together. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. Uh, it's one uh, in many interviews I've not been allowed to elaborate on. I actually said on television last night that um, people were uh, muttering about the green belt, but I thought that it was the rich belt that was really our problem. And those, I kid you not, actually howls of outrage from a, a very small number in the audience who presumably are quite well off. And I think this is the key. I think the problem is that everybody knows it, that there's been a massive shift in the balance of wealth and power. Uh, when I was a, a young man in Birmingham, working in Birmingham, uh, wages formed about two-thirds of gross domestic product, that figure that we use to calculate how well off the country is. Now it's hardly 50% and it's dropping all the time. So in other words, that big difference, that huge chunk of money has gone somewhere. I'll tell you where it is, it's in the Cayman Islands. It's in investments, it's in shares, it's in property. It's in buy to let. There's plenty of money. The problem is who's got it and who's got it. It's people who've got money. If you've got money, you keep money. Most ordinary people are just about coping. They're just about managing. I mean, I sat in uh, a debate where one of the candidates, when challenged about the mayor's salary, which is three times what she thought was the average working wage, said he thought it was reasonable. Hang on, three times. Now, it isn't the average wage, not in the West Midlands. In the West Midlands, most people are lucky to get above 20, 22, 23k a year. And so, although I've argued for the £10 an hour minimum living wage, I'm actually really interested in seeing how we can address that low wage. The West Midlands has, of all the English regions, the highest level of low pay than anywhere. And that's because we swapped our manufacturing industry for the services sector. And the services sector doesn't actually really generate significant wealth. All it does is shift it around. Mm -hmm. And so it's people who are already quite well off who are able to go to all those nice new shops in uh, Grand Central in New Street. You know, we've got a marvellous new centre but the trains don't run any faster. They still queue in the same congestion level. You know, the, the tracks have not been improved. The trains have not been improved. It's just a massive retail opportunity. And yet, what's happening is, with internet shopping, is retail centres, high streets are dying, and big malls, as the Americans call it, are dying. That's not the way forward. That's not going to produce jobs and wealth for ordinary working people. That just enables those who have done quite well to spread their wealth around a little and for some of the crumbs to come off the table for the rest of us. I've always fought for working people all my life and that's what I'm doing now. <laughs>